Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of you that came for the baptism, great to have you with our church family today celebrating little Naomi's uh, getting the robe of righteousness. It's beautiful. All of you who came to worship today on Good Shepherd Sunday and those of you that love your mother and showed it by, hey, I'm going to come to church with you today. Greetings. We're glad to have you. So I uh, grew up in the Dallas area and I went to the public high school and there's a program for vocational agriculture and the associated youth program with it goes along with it is called FFA Future Farmers of America and the the one of the things they have those kids do and I did it was to have a animal project every year and so uh, I love that and just jumped in headlong and mostly I raised Angus heifers they're black cattle and um, I take them to the shows and the State Fair of Texas is one of the shows that we took them to I loved it for lots of reasons But one of them was I got out of school for about three or four days every show I went to. And I went to about four every year. So we're living over there at the State Fair of Texas. How many of you have been to the State Fair of Texas? So about half of you. It's up close to downtown. It's on 277 acres. There's places for people to show their animals and and judging contests for all the different species. Then there's all these exhibit halls, right? People wanting like a fair would have. There's contests for making the best jelly and the best bread and all of that. And then it's a big city and a big state. So there's also this big amusement park. And do you remember what they call the amusement park at the state fair? The Midway. I don't know why, but that's what they call it. And it has like... uh, Uh, 40 rides and it has a 210 foot tall ferris wheel so it's not like the greatest biggest i mean amusement park in the world but it's just a a classic thing an icon in texas so in that midway there are all those guys and that have those little booths where like you throw the ball at the milk bottles and the milk bottles must be made out of lead because you throw it pretty hard and not knock. But if you knock them all down, you get a stuffed animal. You know the thing, right? And all the other kind of games that feel sort of like a gimmick because you spend a lot of money and your parents say, you're not wasting your money on that. You'll never win and that kind of thing. And it's a lot of cotton candy and I can still smell the foot-long hot dogs and the turkey legs. So if you've been there, you kind of know what I'm talking about. And it's important for you to have a visual. And if you haven't been there, I hope I've painted the picture. The Midway is it's right in the middle of the park and the the barns for the animals are probably, I don't know, five football fields away. And they have the different barns for the different animals. And I was in the cattle barn, right? In the sheep barn was a kid one year that had a lamb that was amazingly attached to him. Now, you have a lot of free time. So we wandered around the barns all the time and talked to chase the, you know, boys chasing girls and girls chasing boys and getting to know the other kids. And so we... We went over there and saw this kid with his lamb. And what was amazing about the lamb wasn't anything about its looks, its confirmation. It was about the way it was attached to this boy. My Angus Heifer, if I untied her from her post, I'd be chasing her all over the world. She liked me, but she didn't love me. That lamb loved that boy. And And that lamb was glued to him. And he was proud of it and showing it off. So what he would do is he'd let that lamb out of its pen in that barn when we were over there, it's when I first saw it, and he wouldn't put a leash on it. And that lamb would follow him everywhere. And then he would walk up and down the aisles and he'd say, just try to distract it. So we'd, you know, come and try to pet it, try to grab it, and it would get away from us. And it just stayed within three feet of him the whole time. And then he said, I can even walk through the midway with this lamb. And we said, you cannot. He said, yes, I can. I'll do it. So he takes off out of the barn. You're not supposed to leave the barn with your animals, right? He starts walking toward the midway. We're like, you know, 10 yards behind him. And he walks all the way, and there's kind of like this archway to go to the midway, and then the crowds are all there, and the smells, you know. And, and he starts walking. You know how you have, when you're in a crowd, you have to kind of turn sideways or whatever? He would do that, you know, and kind of disappear. And that lamb would, you know, people are, Wah! because <laughs> lambs are, that lamb's horsing by them. And that lamb was not letting him out of sight, stayed right on that kid the whole time. You got all those noises, all those people yelling to come play the game here and the lights and the smells. He went all the way to the end of the midway, which is kind of an L route, and then did it all the way back to the barn. Now that picture, you know, on Good Shepherd Sunday is in this man's mind, and I hope it's in your mind, when you listen to Jesus Christ 
talk about my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they what follow me I cannot get that picture out of my mind it's just it was so stark and he was so proud of it and he challenged us to get that lamb off course and we couldn't and it's not until this year studying this text again because I've been at this craft a long time studying a long time that I recognize also the fact that this uh, boy was was uh, so proud of it and challenging was part of also Pete Jesus emotions when he said my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me whenever you hear uh, this passage that I'm about to read to you it's usually a uh, spoken to comfort us and I'm going to be showing you the beautiful comfort that we have in it uh, but you need to understand something I need to understand something when Jesus spoke these words he was in a full out brawl with his enemies when he said it he was in a midway the midway was a very crowded place called the temple courts Picture outside of this building, which would be the temple proper, a huge 30-acre courtyard with people all over the place. And there's marketing going on. They're selling animals. A lot of them are sacrificial animals or whatever. But they're also doing some other side gigs on the side. It's crowded. It's noisy. And Jesus, his whole three-year ministry, went there a lot because he went to where the people were. Or he went out in the, the, the far away places and drew the people out to him. So he went to the temple courts a lot. And when he went to the temple courts, this year, it's his last year. You know, John's gospel has 21 chapters. This is chapter 10. It's in the middle. But his, John's gospel is lopsided. Most of the writing in John's gospel is about the last week of Jesus' life. So we're about, by chapter 13, we are deep into the last week. And we got several chapters to go. So chapter 10 is Christmas. They didn't call it that. They called it the Feast of Dedication. What would that be called in Judaism? Hanukkah, right? They were, it was at Christmas and he's in the temple courts. But two months earlier in chapter 10, early in, the, I mean, chapter 9 and 10, he, in the, he had this discourse about being the good shepherd. And two months before our text, he had, he had said to them, I am the gate. And he's talking to the religious leaders who hated him. Unless you lead the sheep through the gate, Jesus, me, you are a thief and a robber. He said, I'm the good shepherd. This is early, two months before our text. I am good as a shepherd because I laid down my life. For the sheep. Hirelings, they would never do that. Wolf comes, wah, they run off. Me, I lay down for the sheep. I, uh, I'll leave that illustration. It's just a time killer, but it would be really fun to share it with you. Ask me in the hallway, I'll tell you an illustration. The, the hireling running off. I lay down my life for the sheep. What's he talking about? Death on the cross that's coming. His whole purpose in life. Nobody really gets it. Not even his followers. Is, and he keeps preaching it. I'm the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, and I'm the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, there were some people that got it. Remember Mary who anointed him? Right? Remember Simeon when he was a baby brought into the temple? He said to Mary, his mother, a sword will pierce through your own soul because this boy's going to die for everybody right so some got it but not many and and so while he's preaching that he's the good shepherd the religious leaders hate him they're jealous of him and all all they want to do is get rid of him so they want to trap him in his words I know if you're a media watcher you hate it when you see people use the media for their or the media uses the words of the people they interview for their own end right Someone just told me this week, one of these news stations in Austin. I used to like this station, but now that main anchor guy, you can tell he's always putting his political twist. His, the, the tone of his voice changes when he does certain reports. You can tell. That was the religious leaders. They didn't like Jesus. So whenever they asked him a question, and I'm going to start this reading this text with their question. Whenever they asked a question, they asked it with ill-gotten intent. They asked him because they're trying to trap him, because they want to use his words against him. 
In fact, when you get to his trial in the story of Jesus, you see how they were using his words against him. One, and, and one time he said, look, I spoke openly in the temple courts. Why didn't you ask me then, right? So they ask him this question, okay? I'm gonna get, now we're at the text, so flip the slide and look at page 10. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It's winter, two months after the Good Shepherd talk. And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, these are the leaders, saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? Tell us if you are the Messiah and tell us plainly. My next question is that your answer to it in your heart is dependent upon your experience with the Bible. If you have any experience at all trying to follow the words of Christ and understand him, you know that a lot of times when people ask him questions, you scratch your head at the way he answered them because <laughs> he doesn't quite answer them usually the way they ask because most of the time, and this is hard for humans to take, but most of the time when we ask questions, we're off base. And these guys were off base. When they said, tell us plainly, you know why they, if he just said, yes, I am the Messiah, they'd arrested him for blasphemy and taken him and done their court case right then. But he knew his court case had to be during the Passover. It was all orchestrated by he and the father that he would die during the Passover as a replacement of the Passover. And the Lord's Supper replaces the Passover and salvation. There's all this stuff going on. And they're not in control, but they want to be in control. They want to kill him right now, so just tell us plainly. Well, why did Jesus not tell him plainly? Because it wasn't his time. But he did tell him. When you say, I am the good shepherd, and, unless you, and I'm the gate, and unless you bring people through the gate, you're, you're a thief and a robber, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I give them eternal life. You're saying you're the Messiah. And he had many other ways. Like, before Abraham was, I was in existence. He had many other ways of saying, I'm the Father's son. And they picked up stones to stone him in chapter 8, two months earlier. So he's already been telling him he's the Messiah without saying the words that they could use in court because they had such a bad motive. So here he says it again without saying it. And look at how he answers. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name, they testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep, remember I told you the words about the sheep following our fighting words? My sheep, listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And the reason I'm saying it that way is you need to understand that's the context. It wasn't like, no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one, you bad guys that are trying to get me, you will not snatch them out of my hand. No, no one will do that. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Wow. They picked up stones again. The next verse says, they're going to stone him. Okay, he said it, but they didn't quite have a court case yet. Okay, what's this little thing he said about works? Do you know what's in chapter 9? He healed a blind man in the temple courts. And they, they almost killed the blind man. Uh, in chapter 11 that's coming, he's going to raise Lazarus. He's, in chapter 5, he healed a guy, and, the, and that's, they picked up stones to stone him in because he was giving thoughts like he was the Messiah. He's been doing miracles under their nose. And they're saying, oh, it's by the prince of demons that he does that. He's possessed by a demon. He says that the Father is his, in heaven, the God is his Father, and that he's his only begotten son. That's a demon-possessed guy. If he's doing miracles, it's because the demons are giving him power to do miracles. They will not believe in him as the redeemer. They will not. And what, this is the key to understanding this text. What they're trying to do is to get the true believers to quit believing. You ever get that feeling, Christian? That in the unbelievers around you, there's almost this, 
their own evangelistic pressure that they've got to try to stump you. They've got to try to get you away. They can't stand it that you have that loyalty and faithfulness to the God who saved your soul. They can't get it and they just don't like it that, that you, there is, there is a, you live for an audience of one and it's not them. They want those masses of people for themselves and they're trying to get them away from Jesus. And so Jesus just says to them, knock yourself out. <laughs> My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And in the book of John, there are examples, two of them very quickly. Nicodemus, if there's anybody who would have religious reasons for not believing in Jesus, it's Nicodemus. Steeped in all the teachings of Judaism, one of the Sanhedrin, one of those Pharisees, and he comes to Jesus at night and Jesus tells him, you must be born again, and then tells him John 3:16, God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And Nicodemus becomes a sheep. But it says quietly because he was afraid of persecution. So Nicodemus, if he's in that crowd of those bad guys because he's one of their fellows, he hears that my sheep listen to my voice and they, I know them and they follow me. I'm in the midway and Nicodemus is right there. And then the woman at the well in Samaria the wool. What a contrast, right? Nicodemus, this very civic, righteous, good guy, upstanding, never been divorced. <laughs> Woman at the well, been divorced five times and living with a man outside of marriage. And Jesus made her one of his sheep because he revealed her need for his love and forgiveness. And she believed she was a sinner. So did Nicodemus. They both were sinners. And she believed in him as her savior. And she's right there behind him wherever he goes. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. You see what we're saying? These, these uh, people that are in the crowd that believe in Jesus, they need what Jesus just said because they have a lot of voices yelling at them. They're like that little lamb walking through the midway and all the voices around them. Like, our voices in that example I gave you of chasing that lamb, trying to get him off course. They needed to hear that. Listen to the voice of Jesus. If I could, if I could give you one, one mandate as you start college, dear high school students, it's listen to the voice of Jesus. You're going to go into a college classroom and you're gonna be far away from your parents and you're going to be enamored with some fantastic lecturers and speakers who have, many of them have no faith. And they are very persuaded in their worldliness and their unbelief and their pseudoscience. And at least 50% of what you hear in any college is opinion. Even a Christian college, it just might be based on the Bible, the opinion part. Listen to Jesus' voice. You're going to have people around you your age that, with the newfound freedom that say you need to experiment sexually. No, listen to Jesus' voice. You're going to have all kinds of new views about morality. When I, I'm talking to a high school graduate that's finishing uh, first year in college. She said, I'm amazed at how many of the kids that went to a Christian high school with me have showed up on Facebook saying things that are diametrically opposed to what the Bible teaches. They have gone off to college, to major university, and now they're arguing, especially with this new Roe versus Wade thing, they're arguing an unscriptural, ungodly position. She goes, that, were, that wasn't who they were just six months ago. Listen to Jesus' voice about morality. Listen to what he says. Look at it in the context of Scripture and listen to Jesus' voice. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I, I, I can just shout as much as I want that you should listen to Jesus' voice. But unless you're in love with him as your Savior, you won't. It's when he becomes your dear redeemer and savior in your heart and you learn to trust that 
any morality he preaches is always surrounded by the grace of God. He knows you can't keep it perfectly. So he took your sins away, right? And he wraps his arms of love and forgiveness around you, and you believe in him as your redeemer, and you say, I believe whatever you tell me because you're my savior. I'm going to give you an example. We didn't have this building. We were over there. It, it, this is, uh, I've been here 30 years. It was 29 years ago, and it was January, and so we were praying after the sermon like we do, and I, was, I thought, it's late January. I'm going to pray about the overturning of the Roe versus Wade, and since that's kind of in the news right now, it's appropriate that I bring this example up too. So I said it in the prayer. Didn't have it about a sermon about it. I didn't harp on it. I just said in the prayer, Lord, with all the babies that are being killed, please overturn Roe versus Wade. Do something in politics, whatever, whatever. This, this man that had been visiting our church, it, he's a college student, jumped up and ran out of the church. I had my back to him. Somebody told me that he did that. And we were making calls the next week, so one of our men, Don Hahn, and I went to see him. And we went to see him. I said, you ran out of church. I didn't get to see you after church. What happened? He goes, I don't think you should be bringing politics into church. I said, what are you talking about? And he told me about the prayer. And I said, I was just praying because it's human life that's involved. I'm sorry. But I said, please come to our Bible study. With all that conversation, he did. Weeks of Bible study, he also had another reason. He was dating a girl at our church, and he wanted to please her. And we went through the fifth commandment, and we talked about thou shalt not kill and murder and what that meant. And he came back the next week after that class to the next class. And he said, over at college, I'm in a sociology class, and we were debating. You know, it was a planned debate by the teacher, and it was about Roe versus Wade. So they said, you know, half of you have to say you're for it, half of you say you're against it, and you guys argue. And he goes, I was told that I had to be on the for it side, but all the while I could tell my heart had changed and I was on the against it side, the freedom to take your own baby. He goes, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I said, I do. You fell in love with Jesus. You're listening to his voice. You're thinking about what Jesus says. And he understood it. Other voices will speak and in, in, in ideas about lots of subjects. I'm just telling you, listen to Jesus' voice. Secondly, listen to Jesus' voice more than yours. Yes, more than yours. Let me give you an example. Uh, Cedar Park High School always had a powerhouse high school football team. About yeah, 15 years ago, there was a high school football player named Blake Gideon. Heard of him? Played for UT after that as a safety. Had a, had a great career at UT. He played at Cedar Park High School. I was watching one of those games on TV, and uh, he intercepted a pass and ran it back 75 yards for a touchdown. The other team scored after that. And then they, uh, he ran in and blocked an extra point and ran it back for two points uh, right, right after that. He had a great game. His dad was the head coach. You know how they do. They interview kids after the game. So the reporter, Friday Night Lights, puts the mic in his mouth. Hey, Blake, you had a great game. You ran for a touchdown. You had, you know, five tackles, and you ran an extra point, you know, block, kick back. What do you think about the game? And this is what Blake said. Um, I don't really think I should comment on how well I played until I watch film with my dad. <laughs> I mean, he had every reason to go, yeah, man, God bless me. I did great. He's like, eh, I'm going to find out what daddy says. I want you to be that way with Jesus. Listen to his voice. Just find out what Jesus says about yourself, right? Because most of the time, I'll tell you, you'll be harder on yourself than Jesus. I don't mean more honest. He needs to keep you honest because you won't be honest with yourself like he will. But you'll be harder because by yourself, you're mostly law and he's mostly what? Gospel. I love you. I forgive you. I died for that. Get over it. I got over it. I paid for it. Get off the guilt party. You're forgiven. And he gets you back on your feet. But he still keeps you honest, right? That's the voice I want to listen to, not my own. My sheep listen to my voice. I lay down my life for them. They love me because I love them. And you guys, you can't touch them. You can try all you want, but they listen to me. And then the second part, he says, I got them in my hand, and nobody can snatch them out. Emotional picture. Did you ever see the movie Taken with Brian Mills? They kidnapped those two girls in Europe, and he's a, he's a retired CIA agent. And when they call him on the phone for a ransom, what does he say? 
I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. But I've learned some incredible skills and abilities in my life and my career. And I'm telling you right now, since you have my daughter, I will hunt you down, I will find you, and I will kill you. And you're just like, whoa, that's even on the trailer, right? Now, Jesus doesn't say that. He says, I will kill me, right? But Jesus is that resolute that he's that possessive. He's that confident. When he's in the middle of that midway and they're trying to distract his sheep, he goes, nobody will get them out of my hand. And when you watch that movie unfold, it's like that daddy's got them in the palm of his hand, but he's got to get to him, right? And he's not any savior and he's fragile and human, but he does it. So it's a picture. No one will get them out of my hand. You ever walked a little child across a parking lot? You see those cars moving around? We were backing out of the parking lot last night, and my wife said, watch out for that little kid. Right? You watch out for those. You've got a little one. They, they, if they know there's danger, they'll reach up and grab your hand. But have you ever reached past their hand and grabbed their wrist? I have. It's like, this is too scary for me to depend on your grip in my hand, and I could get a better grip on your wrist is what I'm saying to myself. So I, I got a hold of you, right? And a couple times in life, I've had a hold of a little child when a big dog comes running up. And what do you do? Lift them way up, away from the dog, right? And they're not holding on. You're holding on. Isn't that a beautiful picture? We say to each other, hold on to Jesus. I was saying, listen to his voice. But dear Christian, he's holding on to you. You're not by yourself out there to face the whole world on your own. He's holding on to you. Just read the book of Acts with that in mind. And watch Paul go through all these scary things. And every, just at the key moment, God comes to him and goes, I got a lot of people. They're going to be taking care of you. Just relax. I got you. He's holding on to you. Your everything in life is in his hand. Your salvation, your safety, and your success. So you're over there having a pity party because you're not as success, successful as you want to be? He's holding on to you. He's got what he defines as success and plan for you. You're worried and scared because you got to go visit the doctor about that report. He's holding on to you. He's got you. Even death is in the midway. I and coming for you, Jesus says, I've conquered it. You've got to pass through it because you're, you're a sinner, but I got you, right? In our unbelief, we believe death is always, we believe it's losing. But what did Paul say in Philippians 1? To die is gain when Jesus is holding on to you, Right? Today you'll be with me in paradise, he told that guy. He's holding on. Jesus was holding on to that guy. Held him right up to the gate. I'll close with a Mother's Day encouragement. To tell you the encouragement, I want to tell you a really funny comparison that I heard once. The difference between fathers and mothers about their kids. And this is an exaggeration, but it's really funny. Mother's heartbeat and their emotions ride the same roller coaster as their children. Things are down, mother's down. Things are up, mothers are up, right? She bear, mama bear, all that. They just ride the, the roller coaster. Fathers, they're vaguely aware that there are people shorter than them living in their house. <laughs> now, we know that's an exaggeration, watching that baby in your arms. I know that's, you're more than that, but... We know, we know that's an exaggeration, but it does accentuate a mother's love, right? And mothers, I've seen it, I've heard it. If your kids seem to be failing, you, you go to blame. There's something, oh, I must have done. Something I didn't do. I, where did I go wrong, right? Whose hand are they in? Not yours only, but Jesus, right? And there's some times where you want to be that she-bear and protect them and the helicopter parent and you want to fix it all or whatever. And then if you can't, then you're all out of sorts. Wait, 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 wait. Whose hand are they in? 
You're in Jesus' hand. We love what God, God loves the love of a mother that I'm talking about. He uses it as an example in Isaiah. He says, can a woman forget her baby or not have compassion on the child that they've born? He said, I will not forget you even if she does forget. So he, he uses a mother's love that I'm talking about because it's a beautiful thing. But it's not, if it's, if it's active concern, yes, but if it's faithless worrying, no. Let Jesus be your children's shepherd. Let Jesus be their savior. Let Jesus be their, their protector and their motivator and their voice. And know this, when he says, my sheep hear my voice, you just keep pointing them through the gate to the Savior and, and trust that he'll bring people into their life that'll be his voice when you can't be. You let go. You can voice Jesus' thoughts and words. Please do find your voice anytime you want, but do it with faithful concern, not faithless worry. Intentional, but not frantic, right? Um, often, but not frenetic. Just be an example and let God be their, their father and their shepherd. He, he loves them more than you. He died for them. And just a footnote, I don't usually do this. I wanted to do it just a second earlier. At the end of this reading, when he says, I and the Father are one, I want to show all of, you, all of you that have ever debated anybody about the Trinity something. They picked up stones to stone him because they didn't like it that he claimed to be God. He was talking about something triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but one God. Jesus and the apostles never talk about the Trinity in a theological debate. They always talk about it when they're comforting us. I and the Father are one. When you got me, the Savior, he's, you know, he's there in the flesh. When you got me as the Savior, you got the Son of God, you've got the Father too. He said it in John's Gospel a little bit later. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's always to comfort us. It's always to minister, never to win an argument. Amen.